Hi, everyone. A quick note before this episode begins. We're going to have a live event again this year at Neshota House Theological Seminary in Wisconsin, and it takes place on July 27th, so later on this month. And we're going to have a live event with Drew Johnson about his book, Biblical Philosophy, A Hebraic Approach to the Old New Testaments. And it will be, again, at Neshota House Theological Seminary in Wisconsin on July 27th from 6.30 to 9.30 p.m. We'd love for you to be there. It's a free event, and it includes food and drinks, so what's not to like about that? It'd be great to connect with a lot of you in person. And uh, if you want to find out about that and to register your spot for the event, go to onscript.study forward slash events, and there you will find all the information you need. Okay, hope to see some of you there. Welcome to the OnScript Podcast, your home for world-class conversations on scripture and theology, where you get to meet some of the best in the field. Visit us at OnScript.study. Say hello on Twitter at OnScript Podcast and stop by our Facebook page at Facebook.com slash OnScript. Hey, OnScript listeners, I'm Matt Lynch coming to you from Regent College in Vancouver. I'm a co-host of OnScript along with Matt Bates, Drew Johnson, Aaron Heim, Chris Tilling, Amy Brown, Hughes, and Jules martinez Olivieri. I hope you're enjoying your summer. A quick note as you host those summer picnics, nothing says picnic like OnScript-themed napkins. Now, we don't sell them, but if you go online, I'm sure there's some website somewhere that does customized napkins. Just rip our logo off the web and slap that baby on a stack of 500 napkins and you'll be set. It's a win-win. Beautiful napkins for you for the summer outings and publicity for us. Thanks for sharing the word. Thanks so much to all of you who give regularly to OnScript, which you can do if you go to onscript.study forward slash donate. And also a quick reminder that our, uh, about our other podcast called Biblical World, which focuses on the history, cultures, archaeology, and geography of the Bible. Just subscribe to Biblical World wherever you listen. Enjoy this episode with Brittany Wilson. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome Dr. Brittany Wilson to the podcast today. Dr. Wilson is Associate Professor of New Testament at Duke Divinity School. She's the author of Unmanly Men, Refigurations of Masculinity in Luke Acts, published by Oxford University Press, which won the Manfred Lautenschläger Award for Theological Promise in 2015. And she's written just recently, just out, The Embodied God, Seeing the Divine in Luke Acts and the Early Church published by Oxford University Press, uh, which we're going to talk about today. Uh, She's also working on a larger project that explores divine embodiment across the New Testament. So, Brittany, welcome to OnScript. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Yeah, great to have you. Um, The, your, your, book um, that we're going to be talking about, The Embodied God in Luke Acts, is, is where I want to focus. But I, I wanted to just start out by asking you a little bit about your previous book and maybe how you got into that project. So, you wrote a book called Unmanly Men. That's a, a provocative title, uh, talking about masculinity in Luke Acts. And what's kind of the big idea in that book? Yeah, well, with that book, I really got interested in it because I was originally, ironically, focusing on portrayals of women in Mm -hmm. Luke Acts. And the more I got into that, the more I realized that people had never actually looked at how men are portrayed in Luke Acts, specifically Mm -hmm. through the lens of masculinity, that meaning sort of constructions of masculinity, how masculinity was understood in the ancient world. So I ended up shifting my focus, if you will, from the women in Luke Acts to to the men, but very much um, discussing the men, sort of key male figures in Luke Acts um, as they um, are portrayed vis-a-vis these ancient constructions of masculinity or what it meant to be a real man in the ancient world. So, so does that study assume certain ideas from the ancient world about what men were supposed to be like? And then you're claiming that Luke Acts is kind of uh, shattering those expectations and portraying men in different ways? Precisely. I, I, I say that he's sort of playing with, if you will, um, 
some of these larger expectations of what it meant to be a quote unquote manly man in the ancient world. And of course, those reconstructions that I see Luke sort of playing with are for the most part elite constructions because mm. those are the majority of our extant sources are written by elite men. So it's you know, yeah. the ways in which Luke is playing with those. And, and, and was the ancient man portrayed as to coin a phrase, wild at heart. <laughs> That's actually, <laughs> yeah, we see modern manifestations of this too. Exactly. Oh. There was this, um, a lot of emphasis on the role of power and exerting power as well as exerting power over oneself. Hmm. So the role of self-control, a, a real man was a self-controlled man who also exerted or power over others, whether that be um, women or people that the Roman Empire had conquered and, and so forth. And what's an example from Luke Acts of someone who breaks that stereotype? Now, in the book, I focus on two minor male characters. So I look at Zechariah in the very beginning of Luke's gospel, who is you know, sort of has power taken away from him, if you will, when he is silenced by the angel Gabriel for not mm. believing his words. I also look at the Ethiopian eunuch from the book of Acts, who is of complicating all sorts of understandings of masculinity in the ancient world, uh, mainly by virtue of him being a eunuch. Um, I also look at two um, major, two primary male characters in Luke and Acts. I look at Paul as well as Jesus. And so I argue that um, Paul's call, his so-called conversion, if you will, his Damascus Road encounter, really kind of complicates common elite understandings of masculinity in the ancient world, and also, in particular, Jesus's own crucifixion. Mm. Yeah, I could imagine that. Um, I mean, just the, the concept of, of taking, uh, considering suffering honorable uh, would have been a, a real subversion of cultural assumptions. Precisely. And the fact that it's considered, you know, one of the most shameful ways to die in the ancient world, too. Mm -hmm. so. Well, that sounds like a fascinating study, and I hope our listeners can dive into that a little more deeply uh, with your book, uh, Unmanly Men. That's an Oxford University Press publication. So, so how did you end up getting into biblical studies? Uh, as, a, as a little girl, did you, um, you know, strive to... Uh, to learn Torah and, and, and teach scripture or what, what's your background and how did you end up in this field? <laughs> yes, I was one of those little girls who, I'm not making this up, would take notes when I was sitting in church, listening to the sermons you know, I and so well. forth. <laughs> did you? Yeah. Okay. That makes me feel better. <laughs> I wasn't alone. My parents thought I was strange. But um, no, I definitely did that as, as a kid. But I really started getting into biblical studies once I got to um, my undergraduate institution. I was a history and religious studies major, and I became especially interested in New Testament studies. So I started taking Greek. I really mm. wanted to read the New Testament in its original language. And after undergrad, I went straight to Duke Divinity School, where I got my master's, and then went on from there for my, my PhD. So, and, and did you do your undergrad at Duke as well? Your history no, undergrad? no, no. I, I'm a Longhorn. I went to the University of Texas in Austin. Okay. So yeah, okay. that's where I did my, my undergrad. And, and what, what were some of those, you know, one of the patterns I've noticed with people that get into biblical studies is they're, you know, they might be in a cognate field or something like that. And they take a class on like the Bible and literature as literature or something like that. I took that class, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah my undergrad. Well, yeah. And did that draw you in? Yeah. I, I, as I remember it happening, I started as a history major because I was always fascinated by history, but it was really the... It was the religious parts of the class, the parts where we studied religion in whatever ancient context that really grabbed my attention. So I ended up adding religious studies as my second major and then specializing after that point. 
I want to talk about your book, The Embodied God. And uh, this is a subject that really interests me. I, I taught a class this last term as we corresponded about uh, earlier on divine presence in the Old Testament. And the, the idea of divine embodiment is a, an area of research and scholarship that's fairly well developed in the Old Testament, but not in the New Testament. There are all kinds of reasons for that that I'm sure you have uh, thoughts on. But one of the questions I had was, um, even for modern Christians or Jews, the idea that God has a body um, wouldn't have been scandalous during the first century, at least for most people, but it is for modern Christians and Jews, uh, that the idea that God has a body. Uh, so, how is it that we've gone from that not being scandalous to now, for a lot of us, that that's a pretty radical idea? I would say that the sort of abridged version, if you will, is that it largely became scandalous with the rise of classical theism during the Middle Ages. So prior to the Middle Ages, we find that Jews and Christians alike actually held a variety of opinions on the nature of God's body or whether God even had a body. But it really, again, is with the Middle Ages and with theologians like Maimonides and Thomas Aquinas, who are, of course, being influenced by Greek philosophy and people like mm -hmm. Plato and Aristotle. But it's really through people like Maimonides and Thomas Aquinas that we start to see a shift happening, where we start to see the sort of majority opinion, if you will, shifting to conceiving of God as an immaterial being. Mm. And, and so... An immaterial being so who is who's inc incorporeal and invisible. Right. Okay. And, and, and this is something you bring out in the book, that it's, it's not like the, when the New Testament talks about God being invisible, that doesn't necessarily mean that were you to be in the heavenly realm and in the presence of God, you would see nothing. Um, but rather, like, it's about our capacity to see God or our access to, to see God. Um, but, but just to go back to the embodiment thing, um, when when we draw this contrast between a modern and ancient view of of you know a lot of ancients did believe god had a body what do we what do you mean or not mean when you say that you know um are, is this like an ontological claim that god in god's self has a body and that's how they thought about it or more of an experiential claim like when we encounter god he comes he appears in a body yeah, that's a great question. And in, in the book, I typically land on it being more of an experiential mm -hmm. claim. So I really focus on the importance of experience and especially human experience in terms of them perceiving God visually. Um, and I argue that New Testament writers, at least, don't really appear to have been thinking in terms of ontology. Mm -hmm. and that's not really um, on their radar, right? So later Christians would very much think in those terms. Yeah. But the New Testament writers, they aren't really interested in the sort of metaphysical claims about the nature of God. Yeah. And, and I guess that's the, the challenge is, is when when it is on the experiential plane of like, as people encounter God, God appears in a body. I, th I think a lot of people could probably get on board with that and say, okay. Um, and they must have also thought that God is in God's self, invisible, incorporeal, but then takes on a body when he, when God appears to people. So, um, and, and you're saying, well, they didn't sort of make that, second move to to say how God is in, in God's self, right? Exactly. So it was you know, later theologizing kind of explains it in those terms, but we don't see the, those moves being made in scriptural texts themselves. And, and do you think there's a, a loss then when we try to fill in that gap, that metaphysical gap? Or do you think that there's an important place for that theologically? So you know, where does that sit in terms of of our theologizing? So, should we be pushing back against making those kinds of ontological claims? Yeah, I mean, on the one hand, I, I understand why people are making those ontological claims, and I... 
I mean, I'm not a systematic theologian, but I understand why systematicians in particular try to look back at the corpus, the corpus of biblical texts and um, try to make sense of what is happening in terms of larger metaphysical underpinnings. But for me, at least, I think it's really interesting to question why. Why is it so important for us to argue that God is incorporeal? Right. Well, what, so what is at stake in that argument, right? And what also, what assumptions might that convey about how we value or perhaps don't value materiality or more specifically material bodies? Right. right? right. So I... I don't completely um, I think the question is important. I think it's important, obviously, to be asking those questions. But my tendency is to want to kind of push back. And again, OK, so why? Again, what's what's at stake here? Yeah, so it might betray some anxiety around bodies that that is it, to some extent a lingering effect of Greek metaphysics. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, I, I, w- I would think that. I would agree with that. So, so you focused your work on Luke Acts. What, what drew you to this body of literature in particular uh, for your study? I, I'm a Luke Acts scholar. I spent a lot of time thinking about uh, Luke and Acts, and it was partly for, for space constraints, right? I really wanted to provide an in-depth look at a New Testament text and its depictions of divine embodiment. But I also think that Luke Acts is an especially interesting test case. For one, it comprises almost an entire third of the New Testament. So it's a substantive, in terms of length at least, um, two-volume work. But Luke Acts, it reflects an awareness of debates about the divine going on in the larger Greco-Roman world. And Luke Acts also seems to reflect a, there's sort of an awareness, if you will, of uh, sort of philosophical arguments concerning the divine also. Luke Acts is often one of those identified as being one of our most kind of uh, philosophically attuned um, New Testament texts. But that being said, Luke Acts does not present God as an invisible, incorporeal uh, being that we know from Platonic philosophy. And instead, we find in Luke Acts the greatest numbers of visions and theophanies, with the exception of Revelation. Uh, We find the greatest number of visions and theophanies than in any other New Testament text. And so I found that um, because of that, again, Luke Acts to emerge as a really interesting test case to explore this idea of divine embodiment in the New Testament. So what are some examples of Luke portraying God with a body in Luke Acts? One of the examples I talk about in Luke Acts, which is not unique to Luke, but is with Jesus's baptism. So at Jesus's baptism, we have God becoming manifest as a voice from heaven. But if we're operating with an understanding of divine embodiment in terms of divine fluidity, which is a concept that Hebrew Bible scholar Benjamin Sommer discusses at length in his own book, The Bodies of God, this idea that God has the ability to sort of fragment, if you will, fragment the divine self and become manifest in different bodies at the same time. If we apply this concept of divine fluidity, Sommer's concept of divine fluidity to Luke and the other synoptic gospels account of the baptism, then we see perhaps a perfect example of that. We see God becoming manifest as a voice, but also becoming manifest as a spirit. In this case, a spirit that descends in theriomorphic form (laughs) in the form of an animal. So the baptism is one example I would list. I would also point to Stephen's vision in Acts 7, when Stephen, he looks into heaven and um, he sees the glory of God and the Son of Man. He sees Jesus standing to the right of God, a scene where God seems to be occupying concrete a space next to which Jesus can stand, and a scene that's also reminiscent of 
these heavenly throne room scenes where we find God's glory appearing, humans seeing God's glory, often a glory that appears in anthropomorphic form. Yeah, those, those are just two examples. I would also, oh, sorry, go on. No, that's that's great. I, I was going to say, I, I, I really like those examples. Um, and, and I think they get at something that uh, happens quite a bit in the Old Testament is that when you get these physical appearances of God, the description of those appearances is often focused on the effects of God, God's body being present. So, rare is it that a text would say, and here's exactly what God looks like, his whole body. You know, it might talk about his feet or his finger or his hand, but a lot more on the throne in the glory surrounding God. And and that seems to jive with what you're saying about Luke Acts. Is there is there a is there a, a reticence still around God's body in these texts? Definitely. I would say there is always an elusive quality to God's visual manifestations, to these theophanies, to these epiphanies we see in Luke and Acts. And I would, I would agree. I think that is very consonant with what we see in the Old Testament. And even in those scenes in the Old Testament where we get a very explicit glimpse if you will, of God's body, we only see a portion of that body. So, you know, Moses sees God's back and so forth. Like right. you, we, we never get the full picture. It's always veiled in mystery. The classic example is Ezekiel. When he sees God's body on the throne, he uses language that's elusive. So it was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God, not it was God in God's self. So, so there's that, that, that reverence maybe or elusiveness around portraying God's body, but that doesn't mean that they didn't think God had a body. And that, that seems to be a driving uh, concern or emphasis in your book. Um, how, does, how does this claim about in d- divine embodiment fit in your mind with some of the other New Testament texts? For instance, um, texts that claim God is invisible, that no one has seen God, the idea that in, in John, you know, that God is spirit. Hebrews calls God the invisible one. So are these just irreconcilable? Are they at, at odds with what we see in Luke Acts or do they fit together? Yeah, I would say that there are a diversity or arguably at least a diversity of views on God's invisibility in the New Testament. So you're right. We do have some texts that seem to indicate that God is invisible. So Colossians 1.15 saying that Christ is the image of the invisible God. Um, the closest we get to a sort of, I hate to use this language, but a kind of ontological, if you will, mm-hmm. the closest we get to an ontological uh, a claim about God's invisibility is in 1 Timothy when it says that no one has seen God or can see God. Hmm. Although even here, notice that humans can't see God, according to 1 Timothy, right? Not necessarily that God can't by, you know, in God's essence, that God can't be seen. Um, So on the one hand, we have texts like that. We have texts like the ones from Hebrews and Colossians and, and John and so forth. But on the other hand, We also have New Testament texts that indicate God can be seen. So the book of Revelation, right, depicting God seated on a throne in a series of visions, or the Synoptic Gospels, where we see uh, God becoming manifest in epiphanies. So we have these two different traditions sitting Mm -hmm. side by side, but even then, as as you already as as we've already intimated, I don't necessarily think they're irreconcilable because when we hear the language of invisible, it might very well be better to translate that word as unseen. Mm-hmm. Again, this idea that God can, at God's own initiative, cannot um, reveal the di- divine self to humans. Humans can't see God, but that's not again to say that God by nature is necessarily invisible. Yeah, I thought that was a really helpful clarification in the book. There's a big difference between invisible and not visible to us. And and that seems to be where maybe our, our minds make the leap, importing more kind of um, modern metaphysical ideas onto the text. Um, what are ways that God's body, as portrayed in Luke-Acts, is unlike 
what we normally associate with a body. So, I'm, I'm thinking in the Old Testament, for instance, God's body, when it's portrayed, you know, surrounded by fire and a cloud, unlike most humans I've encountered, uh, or it's very large, you know, supersized body, to use Mark Smith's language. So, so what, are, what are some ways that there's discontinuity with our concept of a body? And what, what might that say? Yeah, I would say that God's body doesn't behave like typical human bodies. I mentioned a few moments ago, Benjamin Salmer's language of divine fluidity. Mm -hmm. So this idea that God can have multiple bodies or become manifest, if you will, in multiple bodies, this is something that human bodies <laughs> uh, do not experience. <laughs> so there is... There is a radical, even insofar as God's um, visual manifestations can be reminiscent of human bodies and are frequently described um, in anthropomorphic terms, at the same time, that body or bodies also seem to be radically different from mm -hmm. a sort of typical human body. Mm -hmm. I, I want to I switch gears here for a moment, do a speed round. Um, so these are just kind of quick, quick answer how about the book that's had the biggest impact on you in the field of biblical studies? I think I would say in terms of overall approach and ethos, uh, Beverly Gaventa's book on Mary, mm. that that was a book that was hugely influential for me. It's a large reason why I, I went to Princeton Seminary to study with her. Mm. So, so that book has played an important role in my own journey as, I, as a scholar and as a scholar of Luke Acts in particular. I think, uh, I think that book was similarly influential for our co-host, Erin Heim. I don't know if you know her, but I think, I think she had mentioned that book as well. Um, what's one idea in biblical studies that you think needs to die? <laughs> I'm going to steal from Paula Fredrickson here and say um, monotheism. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! Yeah. That's actually the, that's actually the title of an article that okay. an essay she wrote. Well, yeah, I, I'd be curious to to chase that one down, but we'll keep moving. Um, in the interest of the speed round, okay, th this these are specially tailored for you, so I'm going to try these jokes. Out. I've never tried them before. Okay, knock knock. Who's there? Luke. Luke who? Look out and see. And then the follow-up, <laughs> knock, knock. Who's there? Axe. Axe who? Axe me all you want. It's still Luke. <laughs> all right. That was, that was uh, special for you. Hope you appreciated that. Um, if you weren't in education, what career would you pursue? I used to dance when I was little. I, I oh. think I'm past that stage, but I, I did entertain ideas at one point of being a dancer, oh. being a ballet dancer, or perhaps a dancer on the stage. So Fant I'm sure the, you know, Duke University Performing Arts Center, whatever you have there, uh, gives lessons and there's, it's never too late to start. <laughs> okay. Um, so you've talked about Beverly Gaventa. I just wanted to come back to her for a moment and and just ask you a little bit more about her influence on your work. What makes her such a, an extraordinary scholar that made you want to go study with her? And what's some of the influence of her on you? Oh, goodness. That, she's had a huge influence on me um, personally, of course, because she was my advisor, but also on her scholarship. She, she really was and is the scholar that I aspire to, me, uh, to mm. be. She, she brings sort of critical charity to her work that I find tremendously refreshing. There's also a clarity to her writing. She writes so clearly, especially on really difficult, convoluted topics. She has this knack of really getting to the heart oh, <laughs> of wow. the issue and letting kind of the details fall away and she just, she gets at it um, head on. And so I've, I've always admired her ability to do that in her, her academic work. That's a real gift. Also just the model she provided as a mentor. That's something I think I, I also um, aspire to. She was the best kind of mentor and she's now someone that I'm glad to call um, both a mentor and a friend. So I, I'm not sure everyone can say that about their advisors, So, but I'm that's glad true. I can. Oh, that's great. Uh, what's your favorite novel or 
poetry collection that you have? Oh my goodness. I am a huge Harry Potter nerd. So I would probably have to say the Harry Potter series. I'm a huge fan of young adult kind of YA fantasy literature more broadly. Oh. So that's kind of where I spend a lot of my time reading when I'm not reading more academic books. Oh, great. So in addition to Harry Potter, what, you know, what's your next recommendation for within that genre? Um, the Hunger Games are ones that are, is a trilogy I really enjoy. The Bartimaeus trilogy, it's not as well known, but that is, that's a series I, or a trilogy I, I really like. I, I'm currently reading Brandon Sanderson for people who are familiar with the Stormlight Chronicles. The most okay. recent one just came out. So, um, so another book question, you're on a desert island and you get to take one non-biblical book from the ancient world. Uh, what, what do you reach for and bring with you? Hmm, a non-biblical book from the ancient world. I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to pass. I have to get that yeah. some more thought. You're uh, it's a big decision. You're on a I desert know, island, right? You want to make yeah. sure it's going to be a good one. Exactly. Yeah. You, you don't want to pick the wrong one or, you know. Exactly. Uh, so I want to go back to your book um, and, and ask about how does, how does the body of, you know, what does the body of Jesus tell us about God's body? Um, I, I think I was thinking about it and I thought, you know, I guess for a lot of us, we, we sort of feel like Jesus got whatever embodiment God wanted out of his system. <laughs> and, and, you know, he, God is invisible otherwise and got it out of God's system with, with Jesus and then goes back to being incorporeal. So, but what does the body of Jesus tell us about God's body? Oh, goodness. I think there's a lot we could say about this. But one of the main things that I tried to argue in the book, and especially in the second half of the book, is that Jesus is, in fact, a manifestation of God. It's one of the key ways in which God becomes embodied. Um, so that's one thing. I, I can say more about this sort of idea of Jesus's heavenly body, because I think that has some, yeah, um, some interesting, I feel like a lot of modern Christians today, they don't necessarily think about like what happens to Jesus's body after Jesus's departure from earth. Mm -hmm. I kind of heard you say right now, I think a lot of, a lot of people tend to think that Jesus becomes somehow incorporeal again, that Jesus is right. this kind of omnipresent being who is everywhere yet nowhere. Mm. But we see in Luke um, portraying this ascent of Jesus into heaven that it, it seems to be a bodily ascent. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, later creeds would go on to affirm that and to say even more specifically that it was an ascent in the flesh. And so I think for many moderns, this sounds very strange to us, this idea of an embodied person yeah. Where in, is in Jesus heaven. now? Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, but I think that these early Christian witnesses, Luke being a prominent one, I think that these early Christian witnesses um, provide, again, a more sort of positive valuation of the body itself. So uh, the flesh, you know, flesh is fit for the heavenly realm, if you will. And it also, I think, this is kind of circling back to the connection between um, Jesus's body and God's body here, um, this um, picture of the ascended Jesus that we see in the book of Acts in, in particular, I think that there is also a commonality in terms of how Luke portrays the ascended Jesus and how Luke and other Jewish authors portray God in terms of, again, this idea of divine fluidity. Mm -hmm. So we have this sense that, yes, Jesus ascends into heaven, bodily ascends into heaven, is exalted at God's right. But of course, Jesus also appears to people, Paul being a prominent example. Jesus also appears to people when they are on, on earth. Right. So there's this constant tension between Jesus's absence and presence. It's a point of long, you know, 
very much debated in um, on Christian theology, but I feel like this idea of divine fluidity, this idea that God can be present in multiple bodies right, at the same time, <laughs> having that apply also to Jesus helps to explain this sort of very common problem that people encounter of Jesus's right. both his absence and his presence on earth. Right. So when God, when Jesus appears in those post-resurrection appearances, those are not like God, Jesus stepping down off the throne for a moment and he, he's still enthroned, but then also can appear. And, and I guess you could push that further and say, be present somehow by the spirit in the corporate body of, of the church, right? I mean, that, that's, I mean, that's outside the realm of Luke Acts, but that's got to play a major role in your thinking as well as, I guess, as you're pushing forward in this project. Exactly. And I do think it actually does show up in um, the book of Acts, at least. It's not nearly as explicit as something we see in Paul, but mm -hmm. that, again, this famous scene when Paul or Saul is on the road to Damascus and encounters the, the risen, ascended uh, Christ, there is the one of the first things as to Paul is Paul, why are you persecuting me? Right. We've just learned that Paul has been dragging off both men and women into prison and persecuting the church. And Jesus essentially kind of equates that persecution okay. of followers with himself. Right. So it's not as robust as you know this language of the body of Christ that we see in Paul, but I do think it's there. Right, right. Uh, you discuss other mediating figures in Luke Acts, um, you, you know, angels and the spirit. Uh, what what are they and what can they tell us about divine embodiment? Yeah, my discussion of these mediating figures or intermediary figures, that really connects to, that's in my chapter on divine fluidity, mm -hmm. this concept, um, again, that Summer talks about that we keep on coming back to today. And I talk about how these intermediary figures can be ways in which God becomes um, manifest. Again, this idea that God can become manifest in um, different forms, um, but still remain the one God of Israel. And I talk about three main intermediary figures that we see in Second Temple texts and we see also appearing in Luke Acts. And those are what are often called sort of divine attributes. So mm -hmm. you know, the word and wisdom and God's spirit, the spirit, of course, playing an especially prominent role in Luke Acts. Um, sure. so we've got divine attributes. We've got angels, um, especially again, this angel of the Lord. There's always kind of, there's often rather, a sort of slipperiness between God's manifestations and a manifestation of the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. <laughs> so these, these right. angelic figures can be intermediary figures. And then finally, actual humans themselves can be intermediary figures, Moses being a famous one, or this son of man figure, or you know, these messianic figures being um, examples too. Yeah, and, and so the idea is that they show that the divine body can be extended in different ways or fragmented and present in different forms. So that's God's body being unlike a regular human body, but nonetheless conceived of as a body. Exactly. And it goes to this point too, that I at least try to make that there is like, so these intermediary figures, they're somehow one <laughs> with God, mm -hmm but they also seem to show a degree of independence. Even something like the divine attributes, which a lot of people try to argue, oh no, those are just personifications. Those aren't actual agents. Hmm. Well, texts often depict them acting like agents. So it's a way to account for this tension we see in so many Second Temple texts, and I argue early Christian texts as well, like Luke Acts, this tension between God being the most high God, the one God of Israel, but also these intermediary figures having degrees of independence that seem to be acting um, mm -hmm. on their own as well. You know, your, your study has made me think that just as an important methodological move as a biblical scholar, it's always useful 
anytime you read something like, that's just a metaphor, that's just anthropomorphizing, that's just personification, to, to assume the opposite and see what you see, right? Like that, that, that might open up something else for you. And, and I, I wonder, as, as you sort of look across the New Testament, then what else you're going to see by looking through this lens. So we really look forward to your follow-up study, you know, when you have time to write that uh, on divine embodiment across the New Testament. But just as a sort of last question, um, what are some of the theological or practical implications of your study on divine embodiment? That's a great question. I I think there are a lot of different applications. I, I think for me, there are two that are the most important. The first, I feel like we, we've touched on a little bit today already, and that is sort of um, rethinking how we value bodies, problematizing what I often see at least as a kind of hierarchy of the soul or the mind over the body or the immaterial over the material. And I think that this kind of work can um, emphasize, kind of draw attention to the importance of bodies, both in the here and now, as well as in the afterlife. So I would say that's the first thing for me. The second thing I think I would say that we've also been dancing around a little bit um, during our conversation today, but for me, it really reminds me of the deep-seated connections between Judaism and Christianity. And this is really a sort of thread um, that runs throughout the book. I'm really trying to recapture or highlight the Jewish roots of Christian conceptions of God and Christian conceptions of Jesus's own embodiment and relationship with God. So that is something for me that is really motivating me in in writing this book. Benjamin Sommer, who we've mentioned several times in our discussion today, he's got this great remark that he just kind of tosses out at the end of Bodies of God where he says that you know, quite provocatively, I think, um, that it's a, you know, the Christian claim that God has an earthly body, a Holy Spirit, and a heavenly manifestation is in effect, some are claims, a Jewish claim. Mm. And I see, I see my book is largely being a step forward in fleshing out this claim that Summer makes. Fantastic. Well, I... I I love this book and really um, am grateful for what you've done here and what you're going to continue to do. So, Brittany, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with OnScript today and all the best to you in your dance lessons. (laughs) Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here. You have been listening to OnScript, delectable conversations on scripture and theology. If this episode has brought you inner peace or lit your biblical fire, please consider a small donation of just two or five dollars per month. Information on how to donate can be found at onscript.study/donate.